I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many people know what a zephyr is? If you didn't note it, it's in that last song. So you might want to find out what a zephyr is. Decisions, making right choices, not just choosing something, but making right choices. People choose all day long every day. And you made a choice to be here this afternoon. You made a choice to sing or not to sing. You made a choice to pray or to not pray. And when I stepped in the pulpit, you made a choice to listen or not listen. We do that kind of thing all the time. I know from experience down through the years, from my youth to the present, that some people, it's a psychological thing, I guess, that when the preacher steps into the pulpit or the teacher in the classroom gets into that position, they sort of shift into their gear and their mind goes somewhere, but it's not on the sermon. <laughs> or they make a choice as to how they listen to a sermon. They listen to say, well, I need to learn that. Does that apply to me? And is that important to me from the standpoint of helping me walk better? Does it remind me of things I need to do that I become lax in? Does it strengthen me in the things I'm doing that I know is right? We make those choices. We make choices all day long. And there are many choices that certainly we make as we travel through this life that are going to affect our eternal destiny. Joshua said in the long ago, choose you this day. He said that to fleshly Israel. And all people that are of the age of accountability must choose whether or not to obey the gospel of Christ or remain in their sins and lost. And each day, one who's a Christian must choose the direction he or she's going to travel. Will they live like the New Testament teaches? Will they study the Bible? Will they pray? Will they be mindful of their brethren? Will they be mindful of the lost? Will they do what is necessary to prepare themselves to reach the lost? Or will they just simply go on about their business as if there's no afterlife, no spirit? They, in effect, are practical atheists. I know a number of people who are members of the church that are Practical atheist. What does that mean to be a practical atheist? Well, you know, an atheist says there is no God, there's no, no spiritual anything. And you expect them to live like it, and they do to a certain extent anyway. But then there are those who say they are, God exists, the Bible's the Word of God, Christ is the Savior, the Gospel's the power of God to save. We must study the Bible, we must understand it, we must obey the Gospel, we must live the Christian life. But then they go ahead and live just like the atheist. In what way? Well, they don't right, right deny God or deny the deity of Christ or the inspiration of the Scriptures. They just live their lives after they leave the worship period as if there is no God. They do as they please. They're concentrated on the same thing the atheist does, uh, which is of this present world. They're concerned about secular matters and who's this, that, or the other, or the job. But there's very little done in the way of thinking about living closer to the Lord. And which involves knowing the Bible and complying with it. Do we set our sights, as it were, on things below or on things above? Colossians 3, 1 and 2. It comes down to, again, will we seek the kingdom of God first? Knowing God will add all these things to us that we need to this world when we do, Matthew six thirty three, or we will not. And we do. We, we, we either decide, I will seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, or something else is going to come between. And back to the worship, 
we'll either worship God in spirit and in truth or not, and we make the choice. John 4, 24. Very few people give much thought about the end of their days and death. Is there anything after death? Or if they do think of afterlife, they always manage to be saved. Whatever they think salvation means eternally. There are those, of course, who will say that I know the way I'm living and I know where I'm going when I die and it's not heaven. But many people, I would say most people, have some concept of life after death that says everything's a lot better than it is here. But we make choices here in life that we think will take care of things when we die. But a lot of people never think about dying. They just don't. And yet, to the child of God who's faithful, death is the doorway into all we ever hoped for, all we ever labored for here on this life, in this life. I was mentioning at noon, I hadn't thought about it till at noon, when I was at the doctor's office in the waiting room. This was at the hematologist oncologist office. There's several different doctors there. When I walked in, there was a most time you don't see this. There was a couple of paramedics, and they had a poor fellow on a stretcher, and he had a caregiver with him who was really watching over him. But he, just in my observation, I certainly don't claim to be a medical doctor, but he looked like he was in the last stages of cancer. He couldn't do much of anything. And he was, they were waiting on the doctor. One of the paramedics sat down beside me. We spoke. And uh, he said, well, how are you getting along? I said, I'm doing fine. I'm just waiting my turn in line. And uh, he said, yeah, we all, I don't know exactly the words he said, have to live life or something like that. And I said, yeah, we'd all terminate for all of us someday. He didn't say much. I said, it's like the Bible says, it is appointed unto man wants to die, and after that the judgment. Now, I want to try to do this. I tried to do it at the dinner table today. I said, it's appointed unto man once to die and after the judgment. When I said that, he went, <clears throat> he doesn't think of that often, does he? But there, you know, the Bible says God said eternity in the heart of man. And that's what just rattled him right then. In his very nature, there was that that says, I'm going to still be in existence when this flesh and body is on the ground. And I don't know what he was religiously or anything else. But that shows you how you have a place to begin if you can ever possibly begin with some people. But that's there. The very thought for a minute of dying and after that the judgment. And he physically displayed his shakiness. decisions wouldn't it be nice if people would do that and think now why did I do that why does that scare me and then begin to look and try to find out what you need to know so it would not frighten you so God would not be a terror to you so God would not be just to you a consuming fire and that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God unprepared of course decisions Something motivates us to decide things. The Lord makes it clear the decision must be made regarding the direction that one will travel in this fleshly body in this life. A while back we studied this, but we need to think of it all the time. Our, our Lord and Master pleads with us to enter ye in the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction and the many there be which go in thereat for straight or narrow is the gate and straightened the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it Matthew 7 13 through 14 but why why since we're made in the image of God and we have a spirit that's fathered by God 
And you can even make some people shake a little bit when they think of death and the judgment. Why do people do that? Well, they let things dominate their minds. And if they do not want to face their maker who has complete control over them as to where they spend eternity on the basis of how they lived here, then we have the ability to drive that out of our minds, to make ourselves think something else. As the Old Testament writer said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, I want to go back to Moses because a person can benefit not only from a careful study of Moses, of course, from many of the Old Testament, but I think now Moses. And I ask this question in view of decisions. Why in most cases was Moses so successful in his journey through life? The first 40 years of his life, at least that part he could remember, was in regal splendor for the day. He had well, what so many people think they would like to have. But that didn't make a difference to him ultimately. Why did he usually make the right choice in the decisions that he did make? How was he able to accomplish such great and wonderful things for God? Why does he even today serve as a study as we are now to help us all make the right decisions? Well, I think a sampling of verses from God's Word gives us the answer. Not only to why Moses did what he did, but all the great ones of the Bible that are held out as exemplary for us. By faith, Moses when he was an adult, grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now watch the next word, choosing. That's what we're studying. He made a choice. That means he could have gone another direction, but he chose rather to share all of the sufferings and the ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And then it tells us that he accounted the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked into the recompense of the reward. He wasn't living for this life. No matter what he had of the riches and power of ancient Egypt, which there was no power at that day and time greater than that. Yet through teaching, no doubt his mother, who was chosen as his nurse, he had the wherewithal to make the right choice. Turn down all of that, which most people say they want and they strive after. He turned it all down. Turned it all down. Scripture says, and I'm looking at verses 24 through 28 of Hebrews 11, by faith, well, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And it says, by faith he forsook Egypt so because his knowledge of the word of God and his faith in God because of that, that he forsook Egypt. He didn't fear the wrath of the king. It says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. It says it again, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch him. If you make some fundamental, basic, first principle right choices, it makes it easier then to add on the others that go along with it. It's like the foundation of a building. You have to have a good foundation to hold up the superstructure. And you can have the best materials in the superstructure. Have a lousy foundation. It doesn't do that building any good. And if you're in it when it falls, it won't do you any good either. Moses realized that faithfully serving God meant making the right choices in life. We often talk to kids in their high school years that say, where are you going to college? Or what are you going to do with your life? Or, are you going to go to college? Or is it going to be a technical school? Or are you going to be this, that, or the other? And you ought to do this. And you ought to do that. And you need to make some of the right choices, lay the right kind of groundwork. 
But how many of us in the church, members of the family of the living God, we made some right choices to obey the gospel? How many of us really work on one another like we do in trying to get kids ready to grow up and make a living? The key to Moses' success is found in these words. We read it a moment ago, choosing rather to suffer all that ill treatment with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Because he realized that the reproach of Christ was greater than whatever Egypt had to offer. Everybody who will go to heaven will have to come to that conclusion and make that decision based upon the same if they ever remain faith, become faithful and remain faithful to the end. Every one of us will have to say that being faithful in the church is more important than this, 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 and this, and this. These things pass away. Where's Egypt today? And think of Rome if you want to. People who live in the day of imperial Rome couldn't conceive of a greater thing than that. But where is it today? <clears throat> Moses didn't let that which is temporary blind him to the eternal. Now when you read, remember now to, to children, young people, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, that's what it's talking about. Start as a young man to realize the secular affairs of this life are going to be gone someday. Don't choose things that will anchor yourself to this. I've seen people all my life, I've seen people choose jobs to where that's all they have time for. Their family gets a little bit somewhere. Mainly shut them, get out of the way, I'm tired. <laughs> and get through eating supper, I'm going to bed. I don't think that we have ever gotten it quite like we need to because we don't really believe in choosing a low-paying job so we can be a godly man and husband and father and be with them. I know for the, it's a fact, and you've heard it over and over again, that people my parents' age, well, I just want them to have better than I did. I grew up in the Depression. Well, what do they mean better than I did? Well, they meant material things. That's exactly what they meant. Or possibly a better secular education. Because when you go back to the days in America where there was no electricity <laughs> and no refrigerator, when there was no plumbing, when most people lived on the farm, and it was so hot in the summer, we didn't have antibiotics, we hardly had any hospitals, and the doctors didn't know much about anything. Isn't it strange that that's the time we talked about the great meetings when people flocked together and people were being baptized right and left? But the more we received of this present world's bounty, the more our minds got off of going up and got busy going down. So far too many today choose the easy way that promises so much satisfaction. Moses didn't. It's the way that the majority of the world has chosen to travel, and one of the first things a young person needs to know is forget about what people think about you because you love the Lord and keep his commandments. Love the Lord and keep his commandments if you don't have any friends anywhere. Because there's one that sticketh closer than a friend. And you need to learn that when you're a young person. People have the idea, well, can so many be so wrong? Exodus 23, 2. <laughs> yeah, they can be. The wise man reminds all who will hear. I'll say it again. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Do we pretend that sin does not exist, or at least we dilute sin down to where it's just something that doesn't smell too good, but other than that, it's no big deal. It might be sort of like getting a skint knee or something. 
Sin is the only thing that will send you to hell. Nothing, nothing else can do it. Nothing else can separate you from God but sin. Transgressing God's law. Sins of omission and commission. Sin is so terrible in God's sight that he's prepared hell for those who choose to live in it and reject the way of salvation. Sin is so awful and horrible in God's sight that he doesn't want man to go and he gave the best heaven could give to save us from it. But we make light of it. The easy thing to do is to ignore the sinful activities of others. And that even happens in the church. When, when will you as a brother or sister in Christ really take note of the sinful activities of your brethren? What, what must they do or not do before you say that person's lost and that person needs to repent and I need to do what I can to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness? I can tell you one place that it gets overlooked a lot. That's attendance at the worship. People can miss and miss and miss and we're just happy as a lark. Just miss and miss and miss and nothing ever comes of it. Well, that's the elders' business. No, it's everybody's business. It may be there, especially because they're shepherds of the flock and what their duty is, but it's the duty of every faithful member of the church to care about their brothers or sisters. We make decisions. If you choose to let the way and worldly people have their say, Satan gets an uncontested victory. Now, do we go out of our way, out of our way to correct error? Paul pled with the church in Ephesus. Notice the church in Ephesus to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. Is that still applicable to us as the Lord's church? Reproof of sinful pleasure will not result and one being rewarded with the earthly riches, worldly riches. But nevertheless, it is the right choice if one desires to please God and go to heaven. So why was Moses so often able to choose correctly while others were making incorrect choices? Well, I want to give you at least in the remainder, in that rather lengthy introduction, I want to give you at least four reasons that we'll consider. You may come up with more, but these are at least found in the study. First of all, Moses enjoyed the benefit of being nurtured and trained by his own mother. Now think about that for a minute. When you look throughout this country today, what spiritual teaching and guidance and moral conduct and nurturing comes from the mothers of the children today. Well, it's just not there to a great extent. Too many today put the training of their children in the hands of some stranger. And you can see when it comes to public schools what happens. It was said by Paul to Timothy, and that from a babe thou hast known the sacred writings, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.15. He talks about the unfeigned, that means non-hypocritical faith, that was in Timothy's grandmother and mother, and also in Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. So both Moses and Timothy were taught to make right choices, even to sacrifice to make those right choices. We could select Joseph here. It's not by happenstance that when Potiphar's wife tried to get him to commit fornication with her, that he ran from her. Where did he learn to do that? How can I do this great sin before God? Somebody taught him, and he was willing to learn. So there's no substitute for godly training at an early age. You just can't do it. 
So what teaching is being done? Next of all, second, and we've alluded to this already, is, is Moses' great faith in God, but faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So what does that show about his attitude toward the Word of God? Without the Word of God, one will never consistently make right choices. Are we training our children and reminding one another all through life to know the Bible because you have to evaluate things. When you evaluate them, you make choices. It's a truth that belief comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Thus Moses believed in the Word of God and so we should today. But how many people think that way? How many people are designed to be guided by, as we say many times, a thus saith the Lord? Many people today mock it. Just try it on your people around about you and ask them, since sin's a transgression of God's word, and yet God's word is the source of one's faith in God, ask them what they think about sin. Truth of the matter is, and we were talking about this at lunch today, the people don't believe in sin anymore. It's been coming that way for a long time, but more and more don't. You can't have a materialistic, secular society like we have, and people believe in sin as it's set out in the Scriptures. But true Bible faith will always yield to God, Matthew 7, 21. Will always obey His commandments. And we've mentioned Hebrews 5, 8, 9 several times. As well as Jesus' statement to the apostles, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. But third, Moses looked beyond the world to the recompense of his reward, Hebrews eleven twenty six. But remember, he walked by faith. Thus, he looked at everything through the word of God. And when he looked for the recompense of his reward outside of this world, that it was because he knew what the Bible said about it. And we more likely have a deeper understanding of all these things from the New Testament than he ever did because he never had a New Testament. But he had enough to know as even as Abraham did, and Moses had more than Abraham did, to look for a city with has foundations. When you truly, in the light of God's good truth, look at this world and think of heaven, the here and now pales in comparison. <coughs> with the there and then. So we must ever keep before us and everybody else that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the last or the fourth point that I'll make about making right choices and why Moses was able to do what he did, Moses set his sights higher than most this ties been into what we already said on things above. You can choose so many things that they're just passing. Why do people want to choose things of this life and they're all going to pass? They're all just going to pass away. I don't know of any reason to have any amount of wealth or this great, great wealth or moderately so or not other than to do good with it. Uh, what is you going to do with it? Well, we don't think that way. We think of accumulation and that making a difference. Paul pleads with Christians, and he'll be pleading with them to the end of time, saying, set your affection or mind on things above, not on things upon the earth, Colossians 3.2 choices now like I say you go back through and read about Moses the other great ones are listed in Hebrews 11 as people of faith and you may come up with more things but we're going to end this sermon and you're going to have to make a choice it may mean that things known only to you and God that are amiss you can correct right now by repenting and confessing to him praying for forgiveness it may mean your life has been such that it has 
given a bad view to certain people and by the sins you've committed and they've seen as to what it does to the body of Christ. And you need to take care of those things even as they were committed, repenting of your sins and confessing and praying God for forgiveness. When you look at the Lord's church as it's defined in the scriptures, I've said it so many times, it's not just peculiar to me, it's there for everybody to see. We're just a small, minute group. If you were thinking of us as being inside of some body as we are on this earth, and they're doing research on us, they take a microscope to find God's people on this earth. Truly, those who are God's people. And yet, everything you read of in the New Testament concerning heaven is for those people, for you. And for me. And I don't see how that can say anything but just be more determined than ever to please your God. To serve Him. Because there's a day coming when this world, no matter how much you would like to be involved in it, you won't be able to. It's going to pass away, it'll be gone. And we say goodbye to folks and things that are of this world. You know, I can still remember the time. If I die faithful, I'll never see him again. But my grandfather called me, my mother's mother's father. And I can remember, or I called actually, and I can remember his very words because he always called me Bud. And I can remember almost the sound of his voice. I said, Pop, he said, hey, Bud. Last words I ever heard from him. A few months later, he was dead. I'll never see him again because he never obeyed the gospel. On the other hand, when Daddy was in his deathbed, he was so doped up when we got there, he did realize when I came in the room, he said the same thing. Hey, bud. But God willing, He'll say, hey, bud, to me again someday. And I'll say, hey, Daddy. Why do we let these things go by and not prompt our minds to give all we have to learn the truth and obey it and take hold of the opportunities set before us that are very quickly going away? If you need to obey the gospel, you have now. Respond to the truth of God while Christ waits. Will you come to him while we stand and sing?